Chandler, come on up here. Everyone give it up. This is my beautiful wife, Chandler. Can everyone say, what's up, Chandler? We are seven months pregnant with a baby girl. Everyone say, baby girl. Come on. Shout out to all the ladies. Where the ladies at in the room? Say, hey. That's right. This is my beautiful wife, Chandler. Any thoughts? Any thoughts that you want to share with the team? How are you guys doing? You guys doing good tonight? Yeah. You good? You've been having fun? This is, wait, what night is this? Two. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Um, <laughs> he just called me up here and was like, any thoughts? I have a lot of thoughts. But guys, I just have full expectancy that God wants to meet you tonight. And so everyone kind of lean forward a little bit. Look up here at me, lean forward, you just press in, because I think God wants to do something really special. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Love you, Chandler. I know, I'm going I'm, I'm to no, 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 no. call her up again. I kind of put her on the spot. Give it up for Chandler. So if uh, you're writing notes, uh, you definitely get into heaven faster. No, that's not true. But I would like you to write a few things down on your phone, in your notebook, whatever you have. Okay, so the title of this message, we kind of used a few extra minutes in the beginning for some fun. So we're going to jump straight into it. It's called Breakfast on the Beach. Everyone say breakfast <laughs> on the beach. Breakfast on the beach. Secondary title, I kind of like giving two says breakfast on the, is it on there? Did it, did it go on there? I don't know if it, did it go on there? Did it go on the screen? In Jesus' name. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> breakfast on the beach. What I want to talk to you about tonight is love. Everyone say love. love. And lordship. Everyone say lordship. lordship. Now, I don't know who, who in this room, you're a big breakfast person. Raise your hand if you're a big, okay, okay. Anyone a big cereal person? Come on, anyone a big cereal? Okay. Where my lucky charm squad at? Come on, anybody? Yeah, you already know. All right. Where my Captain Crunch people at? Hey. Um, that's it. You know what I mean? No. How many guys? What else do we have? Pop tarts. Any pop tart people? You're like, yo, I mess with those brown sugar. You know what I'm saying? They called me that in high school. No, they didn't. Moving on. Okay. What is it? Yes, pancakes. That. Thank you. Pancakes. Anyone? Pancakes. Now we're going into brunch. Do we have any brunch people? Come on, brunch people. French toast, anyone French toast? Who puts, who puts peanut butter on their pancakes? Anybody, yeah. <laughs> peanut butter on the pancakes, on the French toast, on the waffles, maybe a little chocolate chip, you know what I'm saying? Sprinkle it like that, you know what I'm saying? How about Chick-fil-A breakfast? Anyone mess with that? Yo. This is, I literally just had, this is not a lie, I promise you, I just had Chick-fil-A breakfast for the first time in like two weeks ago, and it changed my life. I got saved again. It was crazy. It's so good. But I mentioned all this, you know, when you think about, you know, maybe even bringing someone breakfast, I remember, again, I brought up my beautiful wife Chandler, and, uh, and the first time she moved over from Orlando to California where we are living, again, Pastor Aaron, let's give it up for Pastor Aaron. What an incredible guy. So I'm from California. We're living in Houston for the year. But when Chandler came over, you know, I had my eyes set on her. I was older, right, 27. Now I'm 33. I'm just a few years older than you, right, big bro. But I wanted to make a good impression. So what did I do? I made her breakfast. Somebody say breakfast. I mean, I even poached the eggs, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it was next level. I stirred it, right? I even had like a pesto spread. I mean, it was a full brunch. The cheese was like brie. And I guess that breakfast worked out because we're married for about five years. Someone get say, come on, Jesus. And why I want to say that is that we all love our breakfast. We all love sharing breakfast with our friends, sharing that funny story with Chandler and I. But if there's someone that has wronged you, you do not want to have breakfast with them. Can I get an amen? amen? You're like, yo, if you're a fan of this team and I'm a fan of this team, you know what I'm saying? Any Chiefs fans, you can leave now. No, I'm just kidding. But you, do you know what I'm saying? I'm a Niner fan, okay? I'm not a Chiefs fan. Uh, I don't believe in Patrick Mahomes. No, he's a good quarterback. But what I'm saying is when we look at different stories in the gospel, I want to, I want to bring you to a story in the book of John where Jesus makes breakfast for some of his people. Everyone say breakfast on the beach. Breakfast on the beach. 
And what I want you to do is I want you, maybe you've heard this story before, but we're going to jump in to a story in the book of John, last chapter in John, and I want to give you some context. So Jesus has just died on the cross. He rose from the grave and all his disciples, everyone say disciples. All his disciples are not even sure if he's come again. A few of the ladies in the squad said that they had seen him. Shout out ladies again. Come on, ladies. And the disciples and the bros were like, I don't know if he actually came. So here we see Jesus showing up for the third time. Everyone say third time. And we're going to jump straight in, okay? So in John 21, it should be up on the screens. Check this out, all right? After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the sea of Tiberias. Everyone say Tiberias. Tiberias. Everyone say it again. Say Tiberias. Tiberias. We're going to talk about that in a second. Shh, shh, shh. Don't be talking. I'll give you the mic. You can preach. The sea of Tiberias. Let's keep reading. And he revealed himself in this way. Everyone say this way. It says Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two others, everyone say two others, of his disciples were together. So that's seven of the 11 disciples. We know there were 12 disciples. One of them betrayed Jesus, that's Judas. He was no longer alive. So there's 11 people that Jesus poured into. And the main leader, the ringleader, tells seven of the 11 this thing, okay? Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Somebody say, I'm going fishing. Go fishing. Say it like you mean it. Look to someone next to you. Come and look to someone next to you. Say, say let's go fishing. <laughs> look to your second option. Look to the second person. Say, say, we could go fishing too. Come on, say that. Say, we could go fishing too. <laughs> Check this out. Peter says this. He says, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. And they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Everyone say nothing. Nothing. Now you got to hear this. We don't have time to go into it, but I want you to hear it. So a lot of the disciples, everyone say disciples. Disciples. Come on, eyes up here. Everyone say disciples. disciples. They were all teenagers. That's what most really, really smart people that we call scholars believe, except maybe one or two. So Peter... When Jesus first called him and his brother Andrew and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, they were all fishing. You guys know a little bit about fishing. Who fishes here? Come on. If you fish, you love it. Come on. Somebody. Trout capital of the globe, right? Come on. I just found that out. It's awesome. So they were fishing, but Jesus shows up earlier in the book of Luke, all through the the, the gospels, and Jesus says, hey, you've been fishing. I'm going to make you fishers of men. And Jesus goes, would you follow me? And the disciples left their boats and they followed Jesus. Now, three years later, everyone say three years later. Three. Say it like you mean to say three years later. Three years later. Three years later. Man, they've seen the dead raised. They've seen sickness heal. They've seen demons, ca- they've seen God move in power. But now they're in a moment where Jesus, everyone say Jesus. There we go. I like that one. Where Jesus said he was going to come back and he hasn't come back. And what Peter decides to do is he decides to go back to his old life. And here's what's amazing. I want you you to hear this. I want you to listen to this. When Peter went back to his old life, he persuaded six other of his core crew with him. But here's what's so incredible about this story. It says that he went fishing all through the night. I don't know, they had nets, you know, but I like doing that more, you know what I'm saying? Said that he got nothing. And I want to encourage you in this moment, I want you you to hear me for the next 10, 15 minutes. I want you to listen. Is that maybe you're in a place like these disciples where you're like, man, I I had a great time with the Lord. I met him in a real way, but, but it's time for me to go back. And you can't even go back to what you used to be good at. Does that make sense? You can't even go back to a life you used to sin anymore. Peter goes back to his old life and it says he caught nothing. Everyone say nothing. nothing. 
and I want you to hear this because all your leaders believe it, is that your actions that you're doing don't just affect you, but all those around you. The reason we're putting this on, why? Is because we believe in who you are. Everyone say, I'm a leader. leader. Come on, say it like you mean it, all the way from the front to the back. Say, I'm a leader. And as a leader, we believe that God's going to use you to reach your friends and family. We believe that. But here's what's amazing. Our decisions don't just affect us, but all those around us. And so Jesus knows this. It says, we'll go with you. They went out on the boat and caught nothing. Everyone say nothing. Nothing. Verse 4, just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. Just for a second, I want you to think about this. So Jesus is having a conversation with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and he's saying, hey, I'm going to surprise my boys, and I'm just going to show up. They ain't even going to know it's me. What does he have? I'm thinking he has a big old mustache, a beard. You know what I'm saying? I'm always thinking because I'm Latino that he's saying, hey, orale. You know what I mean? What's going on? (laughs) He shows up, this random guy on the beach. It's like you used to be the best at video games. You gave it up. You came back, and you can't even play. You're like, what's going on? Some random guy shows up, right? So Jesus shows up on the shore, and he's laughing. Why? Because he's getting ready to encounter his disciples, and this is the moment. Everyone say this moment. moment. Say it like you mean it. Say this moment. This moment moment changed everything. This breakfast changed everything, and you'll see why. So Jesus shows up on the shore. In my mind, he's laughing. Says Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples, everyone say disciples. Disciples says they didn't know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to him, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, nah. That's my version, nah. He said, do you have any fish? And, and in the languages, if you want to dive into it, it's real fun. The question Jesus asked them was, it was actually in a negative context, which means this, which means this. Jesus knew that they didn't catch anything, obviously. But Jesus asked it more like this. He goes, hey, you guys didn't catch any fish. And they're salty. They're like, of course not. With all this noise around. He said, they answered no. Verse 6, he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Everyone say, find some. He said, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the what? Quantity of fish. Keep listening. I want you to hear this. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work. We're not going to talk about that. He's fishing naked for another time. Ask your pastor. But that's crazy. Don't do that. Weird. Okay, moving on. He was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. Now, for a second, I want you to think about this. Hang on. Coming down here. Coming to you. Okay, you got to hear this. You got to, you listening? Put the phone away. Come on, don't make me call it out in front of everybody. Check this out. I, I just did, sorry. Check this out. Check this out. Peter, right? Everyone say Peter. Peter. Peter had denied Jesus three times. Everyone say three times. So, so Peter had literally denied Jesus three times right before he was crucified. So he was at the place, because Peter said to Jesus, if you read in the Gospels, Peter said to Jesus at the Last Supper, the last time Jesus and him partook in a meal. It was a dinner, probably a Thursday. I don't know. Just kidding. Moving on. And Peter goes, yo, I ain't never, again, my version, California, Latino version. Moving on. He goes, I ain't never going to betray you, Jesus. It's Peter. I ain't never going to betray you. I'll be the one that stands by you forever. He was the one. And Jesus said, hey, before the night, ends before the next day begins. You will deny me three times. Everyone say three times. times. Not five times, three times. And so Jesus, when he reveals himself to his disciples, when he reveals himself to Peter, because here's what we got to hear. We're talking about breakfast on the beach. We're talking about love and lordship. We're realizing this. We're realizing that our decisions don't just affect us, but all those around us. The second thing we're realizing is that Peter, what he used to be good at, he's no longer good anymore. What he used to be amazing at, he's no longer amazing anymore. And he's caught in this tension where he's saying, is this life that I lived, is this going to be my highlight or what is going on? Jesus reveals himself to Peter and his disciples. And what does Peter do? He puts on his clothes and it says that he swims to shore 
which it was 100 yards away. Think about that. He swam a football field away. Why? Because Peter was trying once again to prove his love to God through what he could do. I don't know if you've ever been there. I've been there. Still get there sometimes where I feel like, all right, man, I got to prove myself to Jesus. I got to prove that I love him. I got to prove that I'm reading the word. I miss one of my scriptures. I got to do double the next day. Peter was in a place where he's like, I got to make it back up to Jesus. Jesus is going to rebuke me and we're going to find out exactly what he says. But here's what I want to do. I want you to think about this. Peter's swimming with his clothes on. Praise the Lord. Everyone say, praise the Lord. He's swimming, he's swimming, right? And he's standing before Jesus. Check this out. Verse, verse eight it says, the other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish for they were not far from land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish. Everyone say large fish. 153 of them, they counted them. And although there were so many, the nets were not torn. And Jesus said to him, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish. And it says, this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. I want you to write this down. If you're writing down notes, come on, write them down, write them down. I want you to write down this thing. The call of God over your life, the call of God over your life supersedes a bad day, month, and season. I want you to write that down. I want you to, I want you to hear that. The call of God over your life supersedes a bad day, month, and season. And here's what we believe, Pastor Aaron, every pastor in this room, every leader, every church. We believe you're called to greatness. Come on, we, we believe you're called to greatness. And I don't know if you felt the tension in these last few years that it's been a little crazy. Like I've been shut up in my, in my room, you know, for a few years, 2020, 2021, maybe a little bit different. California was closed since yesterday. No, it wasn't. But you know what I mean? You know, it's crazy. But you got to hear that the call of God supersedes a bad day, a bad month, a bad season. And what Jesus does is that he says to his disciples, he goes, hey, let me make you breakfast. I was talking to you earlier. I told you about my wife making her breakfast, poached eggs. It's a big deal. I'll teach you how to do it. I'll send you a video. Move on. Man, we barely share our lucky charms with our fam, right? Siblings, get out of here. This is my special lucky seas, right? Captain Crunch, whatever. But to the people who are our enemies, the people who betrayed us, the disciples, you got to hear this, the people that were supposed to love Jesus all left him. And what does Jesus do? He shows up on the beach making them breakfast. I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this in the room. We talked about this earlier as we were praying. But you may have walked away completely from God. But tonight, tonight's the moment where he's showing up on the shore of your heart. Here's what I want to do. I want all eyes on me real quick. All eyes on me. Shh, shh, shh. What we want to do is we want to show you how to do it. Come on. What we want to do is we want to make this so less hype because we believe you're called to greatness. The, the, the reason we're, we're kind of slowing the, the, the ship down, slowing the sermon down, we're, we're speaking to you in this way is because the world is not holding any punches at throwing at you. Isn't that crazy? Here, here's what's wild. Think about this. I, I want you to hear this. It's one of the first times in, in, in the history in, in America that Christianity percentage amongst young people has gone down. You know, your generation, I love it so much. Gen Z, Gen A, I'm millennial. I love it all. You guys are the best. I vouch for you guys. You know that in your generation, the suicide rate has passed the homicide rate, meaning more of your generation feels helpless than hopeful. And who's the best people to reach your generation is you. And, and here's what's so amazing. You don't have to wait till you're an adult to encounter this love. 
Come on, I want, I want you to hear this. You don't have to wait till you're an adult to encounter this love. Are you a 10-year-old in the room? Get ready. 12-year-old in the room, get ready. Come on, 15-year-old in the room, get ready. You're like, say my age. Whatever age you're in the room, come on, get ready. Why? Because God wants to use you. And what he's trying to do in the same way that he did with the disciples, come on, I want you to hear this, was he was bringing them to the end of themselves. And if we could encourage you anything as big bros and big sisters and pastors and leaders and even family in your life, get to the end of your own strength as soon as possible. And I want to challenge you with something. Come on, I'm leaving. I'm leaving in like four hours, driving to Little Rock, flying out, boom. I want to challenge you something. You tried a bunch of different things. Why not try? Come on, why not try what Jesus has for you? Why not believe the truth that he's spoken over your life? What Jesus was doing to the disciples was he did the exact same thing that he called the disciples into. When he first called them, he multiplied the fish. When he recalled them in this moment, he multiplied the fish again. And Peter was expecting a rebuke. Has anyone ever messed up in here? Come on, that's me. Both hands, legs, knees, elbows, you know what I'm saying? I remember this. I remember one time, I mean, I, I, God healed me of anger and, and, and all that fun, not fun stuff. But I remember one time I had two older sisters. I'm the youngest. We had any young siblings in here? The youngest? Come on. You know, your parents stopped at you because you're the closest to perfection. All right, moving on. All right, keep going. Two older sisters. Can you believe it? What? Oh, look. Hey, sh- I like it. Who's got three? Who, who's got three? I'm praying for you, bro. Praying for you too. Okay, I got you. We'll circle up at the end. Okay, I'll tell you what I did wrong. Don't do any of that. You guys do what's right. Okay, check this out. I remember one time, I was so mad. Sisters locked me out. Other things happened. I kicked the door so hard. It was a metal screen door. Boom! And then my mom's was like, wait till your father comes home. I'm like, oh my. <laughs> Anybody? Anybody ever have that? Wait till your dad. Ooh, ooh, oh my God. Oh my God. I don't know if you've ever been there. Maybe it's not that story, but, but you actually have failed. I could have blamed my sisters, which it was their fault. No, it was. But where you failed and you're expecting a rebuke, right? You're expecting to be punished. I want you to hear this. I want you to grasp this because you can. When, many times our relationship with God is we feel like we got to work for God's love. Everyone say work for God's love. Say it like you mean it. Come on, say work for. Everybody ever say work for. God's love. And what God's trying to speak to us, what Jesus is saying, is he's saying you don't have to work for my love, you work from my love. And that little, what we call nuance, that little shift, that little change will change everything. Peter, I want you to hear this. The mistake that you made, you know it. Maybe no one even knows it. And you're expecting punishment. Peter, The worst thing he could do was walk away from Jesus, and Jesus shows up on the shore and cooks him breakfast. And he shows him mercy, and he shows him love. I'm going to jump up here. Pray I make it. Hiya. Amen. Let's keep going because we don't got that much time. So here we get into it. Peter's dripping, and I'm not just saying with swag, actually with water. There's a fire crackling. I don't know why I made that noise. I just did. <laughs> Let's go with it. <laughs> it's an electric fire. He brought it down from 2020. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the disciples are like, ooh, you know what I'm saying? No smoke, you know? All right. Fish and bread. First of all, my question is, how'd they get that fish and bread there in the first place? It was already on the fire. That's heavenly bread. That's the kind of bread when you eat it, it turns to muscle. You know what I'm saying? That's the kind of bread we all want in Jesus' name. Give me them carbs, right? Moving on. So they're eating, right? And I don't know if you've ever done this. You're like waiting. And Peter's probably thinking, man, Jesus is trying to fatten me up before he punishes me. He's eating, he's eating. And here we get to the moment in scripture that changed everything. Are you ready? Here's the moment we get where it re-enlists Peter. I'm going to get the band back up. We're about to finish. Keys come in behind me, so the Holy Spirit's here. No, he's here already. Come on, stop it. In verse 15, 
It says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, you know that I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. Shh, shh, almost done. Shh, shh, don't make me call you out again. I'll do it in love. He said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, you know that I love you. He said, feed my lambs. Verse 16, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And then he goes on and says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk whichever way you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hand and another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. It says this, he said, to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Before we get to that last part, I want you to hear this, okay? So Jesus finished breakfast and Jesus is on this side and he asked Peter, hey, do you love me? Peter goes, you know that I do. He goes, feed my sheep. Second time, do you love me? You know I love you, tend my lambs. Third time, do you love me? And then it says Peter was grieved. That means there has to be something in there that was different than the time he said it. And I want you to hear this, okay? I want you to hear this for one second. You know, in, in, in the Greek, in the Hebrew, in, in the languages that the transcript was written, what, some of these words mean deeper meanings than it comes to us. We read a love that is said that many times and we're like, oh, he was just grieved because he asked him three times and he betrayed him three times. I, I don't believe that to be the case. You see, there's four different words in the Greek that's used for love, the word that Jesus was using was a love that's unconditional. Everyone say unconditional. It's a Greek word that is actually agape or agapo. And so Jesus was saying to Peter, hey, Peter, you got a full belly. You swam 100 yards. You're a strong guy. But do you unconditionally love me? That's what Jesus was asking. OK, you following? And, G and, and Peter on this side, after eating that heavenly manna, that bread, that fish, it was fire, it was like a poke bowl or something. And Peter goes, yo, Jesus, again, my version, you know I love you, but his word for love that he was using is that Greek word that's pronounced phileo, which means a friendship love, or better use, a conditional. Everyone say conditional. So, so what that means is a love, but it's not forever. It's, it's a love, but has limits. Peter goes, God, I, I love you, but my love is conditional. The second time Jesus says, he goes, hey, Peter, that bread was good. That fish was good, right? But do you unconditionally love me? And Peter on this side, Peter's eating. He's looking at Jesus. The other six of the disciples are there. Peter goes, Jesus, you know, I love you. But that word he used was, God, I, I I love you, but only to a certain point. I love you, but with conditions on it. It's not an unconditional forever love. And then Jesus on the third time switches it on him. And Jesus uses the same word that Peter used. And Jesus goes, okay, Peter, but do you conditionally love me? Do you phileo? The word he was using was different. And that's why I believe it looks, it says Peter was grieved because what was happening? Peter responded to Jesus and he says, Jesus, you know I love you, but with condition. I want, I want you to hear this and I promise you'll get it. Religion will tell you that you have to work for God's love. I'm gonna say it again, I want you to hear it. I want your eyes up here. Religion will tell you that you have to work for God's love. The world will tell you that it has all the love that you could ever need. Both of those are a lie. And what Jesus was telling Peter, and what you have the opportunity to say yes to tonight and have an understanding that could change your life forever is realize that Jesus was telling Peter, hey, Peter, it takes me to love me. In the book of John, 1 John, it actually says that God is love. Everyone say, God, God is, is love. love. I'm going to hear this. 
Jesus was telling Peter, Peter, it takes me to love me. You can't prove yourself to be a follower of me. And I feel like what we wanna set a stake in the ground tonight in your life at whatever age or grade you're in, junior high, high school, middle school, college, or maybe you're a pastor and you needed this message, a leader, a parent, that it takes God to love God. It takes him to love him, that we come to the end of ourself and that's where his love begins. If you're writing down notes, I want you to write this down. It's simple, but I want you to remember it, that love is the message. That love is the message. The one thing that Peter was getting ready to do was go back to his old life. And Jesus shows up when he could have rebuked him, when he could have said, I'm making new disciples. I'm not even thinking about you. He re-enlists them in their calling. Why? Because he shows them it takes love. It takes me to love me. And then at the very end, we read that verse, verse 19. The very end, it says this. Jesus says to him, the two words that he said to him in the beginning, he said, follow me. I want you to write that third point down. I want you to write down, follow me is the invitation. And tonight, I'm just, I, I'm, I don't know if you could tell, but we're just so excited for you guys. Man, you guys have a bright future. In this room, there's incredible pastors and missionaries, leaders and doctors and poets. And you're like, poet, take me. Yeah, singers, hey, you know what I'm saying? Obviously, I wasn't a singer. That's why I'm preaching, you know what I'm saying? Not with the band. But whatever it is, whatever you feel called to, we're all called to follow Jesus. And tonight there's an invitation. There's two actually. But when Jesus said that, follow me, that word was follow me and keep on following me. Follow me and keep on following me. And here, here's what I want to do. I want us all just to stand where we're at. Come on, just, just everyone stand. I'm going to stretch a little bit. Bow your heads, close your eyes. And the first thing what I want to do is everywhere I preach, everywhere I have the opportunity to just share the gospel, share the love of Jesus, I always want to give an opportunity for you in this room to surrender your life to Jesus. You know, I, a lot of times I use this analogy where imagine if your life, maybe you can't drive yet, but your life is like a car. And maybe in your life you grew up going to church or you know, your parents went to church and your, 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 your parents forced you to go to church. And I, I always say this, I say, you've heard this a lot, being a Christian, you know, going to church doesn't make you a Christian just like standing in a garage makes you a car, right? You could go vroom, vroom, vroom. You ain't no car, you know what I'm saying? So you being here doesn't mean like, hey man, hallelujah, thank you Jesus, I'm here. No, it's a personal decision in Jesus that you make at any age. And maybe in the analogy, let's say your life is like your car. Imagine if you're driving, you're driving whatever kind of whip you want. If you don't have a car, imagine you do in Jesus' name and you're driving and Jesus is on the side and sitting in the passenger and you're like, hey Jesus, just whisper me scriptures and sweet nothings, but I know where I'm going. I know my future, I know my plans, all this stuff. But, but true lordship, we talk about love and lordship, what Jesus was calling the disciples into with all heads bowed and all his clothes, is, is true surrender and lordship to Jesus is when metaphorically speaking, Jesus taps us on the shoulder, says to pull the car over, I'm driving. I'm, I'm driving. And you're like, but God, you don't know it. You don't know the people I'm going to, you know, date and marry. You don't know what I'm going to do, da, 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 all these different stuff. You don't know the snacks I like, God. God's like, no, 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 you don't get it. You have to let me lead everything. And we have this saying, I want you to hear this, head bowed, eyes closed. Come on, no, no one looking around. That Jesus is, Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And here's what I want to invite you to, because it's the best decision you can make for you to go all in tonight. So the first call is a call for salvation. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus and tonight's your moment. Or you've given your life to Jesus, you've walked away from God, you've been distant from him, and you feel like tonight you, you need to make it right. You need to be, maybe this, maybe you've done this many times, but let's make this your last time. So whether it's your first time or your last time, no one looking around, 
All heads bowed, eyes closed. If that's you, on the count of three, I just want you to shoot your hand up and back down on the count of three. One, Jesus loves you with an everlasting love. Hands are already going up. Two, this is the greatest decision you can make. Three, if that's you, I want you to lift it up right now. Come on, lift it up high. Lift it up high. Thank you. Thank you. We'll wait. We'll wait. Keep it up. Keep it up. Thank you. Amen. I see those hands. Come on. Anyone else? You're like, man, I got to do it. First time, last time. If that's me, right now on the count of three. One, two, three. If that's you, lift it up. Come on. Here's what we're going to do. You can put your hands down. We're going to make the loudest cheer we made for every person that responded. Come on, come on. Someone put their hands together. Somebody shout for Jesus. Say, come on, Jesus. Somebody say, Jesus, on three. One, two, three. Jesus. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray this out all together because we're more than a family. Come on, we're going to pray this out. Everybody, whether you raise your hand or not, everyone say this. Say, Jesus. We thank you that you came, you died on a cross, you rose from the grave, you paid the price that we can never, t that we can never pay to give us a relationship that we can never attain. We recognize that we're sinners, that we've fallen short, and we ask for your forgiveness. And we thank you, Jesus, for forgiving us, for forgiving me and wiping my slate clean. So tonight, Jesus, I say yes. Come on, all together. Say, I say yes to you, Jesus, being my Lord and Savior of my life. Say, Holy Spirit, come and fill me up and use me for the rest of my life. Come on, someone give a shout to Jesus. We thank you. Come on. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to worship for a second. But the second call is something that, as we were talking with Pastor Aaron, we really felt strong. And here's the thing is, real quick, everyone stand. Come on, stand in the back. Come on, come on, stand in the back. Thank you. I want you to do this. Just, just, this is a fear of God moment. Everyone say fear of God. Just bring it down just a little bit. Meaning this, this isn't a pressure moment at all, but this is a real moment. We actually believe this, and I'll tell you this. When I was 17, grew up, I was a missionary kid, grew up in church, doing my own thing, the whole story. I was 17 years old, I just graduated high school, helping out at a youth camp, still doing bad stuff. And it was in a worship moment like this. One of the speakers, one of the leaders came up and gave me a word. I had heard it my whole life but it changed the trajectory of my life because he said, you have to make a decision right now. What do you want to do with your life? And I didn't know what it meant. I was 17 and I said, all right, God, I'll do it. And I did something that I thought would just be six months and 16 years later, I'm still in full-time ministry. And here's what we believe. And what we mean that by this is, this is a no pressure policy. But if you feel that, man, God, I feel like I got a call to ministry. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if it's pastoring or missionary or whatever it is. But if, if that's you, we really wanted to create a space tonight to pray for you. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have everything together. But we really believe that God wants to, to mark you. And in the book of Acts, it said they set aside two guys, Paul and Barnabas, for the work of ministry. And it changed the game. And we believe that tonight, tonight could be a moment like that. And so all heads up, eyes open. You know what I'm saying? Because if you're gonna say, I wanna be in ministry, it's gonna be a bold declaration. I want you to get out of your chair. I want you to make your way up here. You might not know what that looks like. It might be just one or two of you. You want you to make your way up to the altar and we wanna pray for you because we believe, we really believe in your life. It's a crazy thing. It takes, we say it takes one egg to crack. So if that's you, if you feel it, you're like, man, I feel it. I don't know what it looks like. I'm, I'm scared. It might be worse leader pastor. I want you to come up. Come on, can we make some noise? Come on, let's make some noise. Come on, girl. Let's go. I told you. Come on, ladies. Thank you for opening up. Come on, make some noise. Come on, make some noise. Anyone else? Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Anybody else? I think there's a few more. I think there's a few more. Is that you, buddy? Come on, let's make some noise. You might, let's go.